charisma of a person is very important. I don't care how you're gonna be, but try to be different. If you are normal, then nobody cares about you. Hello and welcome to the Ronnie Lever Show, where every week we bring you fascinating guests with inspiring stories of success and overcoming obstacles from the world of sports, business, and entertainment. To support this channel, please subscribe, turn on the notification bell, and hit the like button so that we can deliver you the best content possible. He's born in Romania, living in Hungary, and fluent in four and a half languages. At the age of 20, he started to get into sports business with his dad. They founded a boxing promotion back in 1993, putting on their first professional event. In 2003, he was the first ever promoter that put on a boxing event in Dubai. He was handling the career of more than 120 professional boxers and has produced more than 50 champions in the WBO, IBO and IBF, including three world champions. He holds the Hungarian television viewer record with 3.2 million viewers back in 2003. He's an eight-time boxing manager of the year, a five-time boxing promoter of the year, a one-time sports manager of the year, and a one-time titan of the year. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy to have him on the show. Here is Felix Ratz. Hello, thank you to be there. Thank you very much. You know, I was I was listening to all these things and I I was like, you know, uh, in the ring before before the fight and uh, the MC, you know, just just introduced me, you know, in the red corner. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, so I was actually going to ask, like, um, when I hear all of your accolades, what comes to mind to you? Oh, I don't know. Sometimes I, I just, uh, I just don't believe, you know. So my daughter, you know, she, she used to, to watch and to, to read, you know, articles, uh, you know, on the Google, you know, about, about his mother and about her father also, and. Uh, it's, it's just amazing, you know, sometimes, you know, that, you know, I, I, I have done, you know, a couple of things that I, I really don't, don't remember, you know. So actually, you know, when I was sending, you know, a couple of things, you know, I was just, wow, you know, so it was 20 years ago when we got, you know, the first uh, event in Dubai and uh, I, I just uh, observed, you know, that all the big promoters now they are in Dubai, you know, like 18, 20 years later. So I was kind of of pioneer, you know, of the Dubai uh, professional boxing. <laughs> a pioneer. So, um, and, and one thing also that comes to mind, because this show is all about also inspiring people, also somebody who is in a crosswalk, somebody who is um, maybe thinking, am I going to take the left or the right way or the blue or the red pill, so to say, like which way to go. When you were a kid, like usually, um, what were the things that you wanted to do? I, I guess he was probably not a boxing promoter or did you grow up in a boxing family? I grew up in a boxing family. My father was the, the coach of the Romanian national team. But actually, till the age of uh, 16, 17, I wanted to be a vet. So, a vet? Uh, a veterinarian? Yes. So um, I, I didn't, I, I wasn't thinking at all, you know, that uh, being, you know, a promoter or a manager, you know, I mean, in the 80s, you know, I, uh, this this uh, job you know it was a kind of non-existing job you know so i was i was reading at the time about you know uh, muhammad ali and about uh, you know don king or uh, you know the, the the four bigs you know leonard hagler uh, duran and uh, and hers and uh, about bob Arum, you know who was also a big promoter at the time and you know he managed a couple of boxers but you know, in Europe, especially in East Europe, you know, uh, it, it wasn't such a tradition, you know, for professional boxing or, you know, for, for being like a manager or a promoter. It was, a, you know, a non-existing word, you know. So if, you, if I would say to, some, to someone, you know, that I want to be a promoter at the age of, you know, uh, 25, you know, everybody would too much. What? What would you want to be? So it's like, uh, you know, so we are talking about, you know, 80s. <laughs> but but also now, like yeah, for for somebody who is listening to us who doesn't actually have an idea what a promoter is or like what 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 does a boxing promoter do? You know, uh, 
in US, it's it's a little bit different than in Europe because in Europe, you know, you can be the manager and the promoter of a boxer. In US, you can be either the manager, either the promoter of the boxer. So between the two is a big difference because, you know, the manager is looking for your interest and uh, he wants the best of you because, you know, he has a percentage out of, you know, your amount. Uh, you as the boxer. Sorry? You as the boxer, like he, he has an interest in the boxer. Yes, yes, because, you know, he got the percentage, you know, of his purse. And uh, the promoter, let's say a little bit, you know, he doesn't care about your career. He just want to do, you know, he was just, he just want to organize, you know, the best fights. So we just put, you know, together the best fighters in the ring. And, uh, you know, in, in Europe, because you can do both of them. So actually I was doing both of them because uh, they were not manager or they were not promoter. So maybe if we have had, you know, a promoter in Hungary, maybe I would uh, rather do, you know, being a manager or the inverse, you know, but uh, because it was a non-existing job, I have to do both of them. And, uh, you know, I was, I was uh, taking care of my boxers. I was building them. I mean, you know, to sell a boxer, to sell someone, you have to introduce him, you know, to the media, to all the people. We are going to get into that. We're going to get into that in detail, Felix. And, and, okay. and that's going to be really, really, before we actually step into that, I would still like to know uh, about you, like when you grew up and, and also growing up in a boxing family, did you, because oftentimes um, people who end up then on the other side of being an athlete, basically like as uh, on the business aspect of that, some of, or many of them have been formerly an athlete themselves. Was it for you that you wanted to become a boxer yourself or was it, were you always more interested in the business aspect, in the entrepreneurial aspect? Uh, you know, I, I, uh, I saw very quickly, you know, when I was in the ring because I was trying, you know, boxing that uh, I'm not that talented, so I will, uh, I will never be a world champion or an Olympic champion. And uh, I was always, always, you know, honest to myself because uh, then, you know, I, I was avoided, you know, to get into something which, uh, which, which it's not comfortable, you know, which doesn't fit. And uh, I always liked, you know, to, to do businesses. I always liked, you know, to represent someone. Actually, you know, I was better even on the school, you know, I was better when I had to represent, you know, someone from, from my mates, you know, to the teacher or to the school, than uh, when I had to, to represent myself. Because I was shy, you know, so I mean, how can you tell something good about yourself? So, but it was easier, you know, to tell good things about your friends, about your classmates, you know, about everybody else. And uh, then I said, okay, let's, let's try to do this, you know, because I love, you know, boxing is my my forever love and uh, i said to myself okay let's 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 try to see you know how i was gonna end up and uh, then i realized you know that i'm let's say you know uh, i'm comfortable with this business and uh, first first of all i i started you know to learn how the business works you know so to go abroad to go outside did you, did you learn that from your dad or, or how did you learn that like also because i know that your dad was also your mentor Yes. So what role yeah, did he but, play in that as well? Yeah, we, we started together. So basically, we, we learned to each other, you know, these kind of things. Because my father was the coach of the national amateur team. And then, you know, he said, you know, he woke up one morning and he said, that, okay, I want to I wanna do professional boxing in Hungary. No one does. No one is doing, you know, this. So I want to be the first. That was, you know, like in 92. And they said, okay, wow, you know, professional boxing sounds good, you know, so I knew a lot of professional boxers, but how are we going to that stop? was at a time when Hungary just actually came out of communism. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, I mean, you know, it was like, you know, and uh, we started to go, you know, in, uh, we started to search, you know, for boxing events abroad. And actually one of my first ever boxing event, you know, which I was visited, 
It was in Vienna, in Lugner city. <laughs> okay. And, and the promoter of this event was a guy called Janeczka, who got, you know, uh, jewelry shops and everything. So he was the promoter and he was a sponsor of the event. And mm -hmm. at that time, you know, it was a couple of, of good boxers, you know, in, uh, in Austria, like, uh, like Werner Lederhaus, Rudy Lutz, Harry Geyer, and a couple of foreigner boxers, you know, coming. Harry Geyer even had a world championship fight later on. Yeah, 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 exactly. And it was like Biko Botova Mungo, you know, the big heavyweight. Uh, the last uh, Austrian who was at the Olympics in 1988. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So James Osusendo, so a couple of good boxers over there. Ed Ipsekovic, he just, you know, retired, you know, a few years prior. And uh, we tried to learn, you know, how to do. It was just watching the event, you know, and we, we, we tried, you know, to, to figure out, you know, how, how the business could work. And then we went, you know, to Belgium, to another promoter. Then we went to Germany. And uh, we got, you know, an idea about how to promote an event. And we start, you know... We have done, you know, our first professional event in 93 in March in Sexart, which was a, a very good event because it was a, a sellout in like, you know, one, two days because it was not because of us. Or it was not because it was very good. It was because it was new, it was something new. And the people was reading or was heard about professional boxing only on the newspapers and on TV. So, so you were excited. you were basically you were meeting the zeitgeist, so to say, like you were meeting something that people were starving for. Or, or there is also a secret, like uh, in business, if you yeah. like the <clears throat> best way to actually to sell something is not the best promotion. Or like if you want to sell food, for example, it's not the best promotion. It's not the whatever. It's it's to have a starving crowd. Like if you're yeah. selling water bottles in the desert, you can be the worst promoter ever. But you're gonna <laughs> you're gonna sell like crazy. So that, and not saying that you're the worst promoter ever. I'm just no, no, no. I mean, you know, so that that was the case, but it was a very positive step into the business because you know, if you are doing an event and uh, you have like you know hundred uh, you know um, ticket buyers, you know, it's 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 different. But when you when you finish an event with a sellout, and then the people they are talking about. And, uh, you know, it gives you a, a positive, you know, impact. And then, you know, so with this... Just one, one more question, actually, before you, before you take uh, us further. <clears throat> you, what I really like is that you said that you went to different countries, to different events, and to, to really look at what they were doing and to observe. Because it's also an approach that I used when I, when I started out in, in, in hosting events and so on. Like, I went to different events, looked at what they were doing. So what I was, what I was wondering now... On the one hand, what did you learn? And also, how are boxing events different to other events? Oh, it's, it's uh, first of all, you know, it's, it's the, the visual elements. You know, you can see, you know, you are, as, a, as a popular MC, you know, you have been in, in a lot of countries. You can see, you know, that there is difference, you know, between events and events, you know, you have, you know, in the background you know like big screens you have good quality music you have a good entrance with eventual singers you have a nice ring you know not bloodied you know uh, you have you know like the chairs you know in in the road you know and not in different places so they, there's a lot of tiny things you know which which seems to be tiny things but at the end of the day you know they are they are big things and they are good things you know to see and to have an example and uh, you know we have been when we we was just observing you know we have been in different places because we didn't have the time you know our place for promote so we said that okay let's go in a shopping mall because maybe we're gonna promote on a shopping mall and we know that in vienna you know in lunar city there is a, there is a boxing in a shopping mall okay then let's go in a bar in Spain, it has been an event every second Friday, so twice per month, in a in a discotheque, you know. And 
it was like for years because the the guy the owner was a fanatic of boxing and actually he was not managing nobody he was promoting he was just doing you know a against b c against d because he wanted to watch you know good fights he didn't care about the winner he was just paying them And what's that, the business? What's the business model at, 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 the, at the boxing promoter? I'm just wondering. Like, is it because you need to pay the boxers in a way that yeah. they fight, and you then get to keep the like everything that that comes in from tickets and from possibly Ticket. TV and and, and sponsors? So how is that? Yeah, TV rights, you know, additional, you know, merchandise. So you have, you know, like four or five uh, different kind of incomings. And if you are smart, you know, so you can um, you can you can do something profitable. So that's depend, you know, on on uh, on when 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 and where you are doing, you know, the event. You know, just an example. You know, you have where we have met each other, you know, in Germany. You have boxers, you know, which are which are not really good. So I mean, you know, they will never be a world champions, but they have charisma. And they mm -hmm. can sell tickets. And I had, you know, a couple of boxers who were, let's be honest, nothing special, very nice guys, decent boxers, but no special. But they were selling, you know, like six, seven, eight hundred tickets, which is which is not bad, you know. Mm -hmm. But when you have, you know, an event, an event, it's like six, eight fights. And when you have, you know, three, four kids like this who are selling, you know, on average, like uh, four or five hundred tickets, then you are okay because you have a two thousand, you know, two thousand five hundred call, you know, so it's, it's, it's okay. Then you have the sponsors. Then if you are lucky, you have TV. Then you can have, you know, like merchandise, like uh, all kind of gloves, the, you know, T-shirts, etc., everything. And uh, you can have, you know, good incomings, you know, if you are, you know, you can do, you know, the catering, you can do the parking, depending on when and where you are doing. That's fascinating. So I'm, I'm going to actually go into this a little bit later with the charisma aspect. Um, as of now, when you, you said your first event was a sellout. Mm -hmm. And usually also in the beginning, there are some obstacles. And of course, in, in, on the outside, it looks quite shiny because, hey, first event, sell out like man, you did everything right. Did you also face some obstacles in the beginning or like that, that you had to overcome? Oh, yes, of course. You know, so our first three or four events were, were all, you know, with, were losing money on it because we didn't know, you know, we, we, we couldn't sell to the sponsors because the sponsors haven't seen prior, you know, a boxing event. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, uh, it, it's like, you know, you are selling a, uh, air on the bottle, you know, so everybody <laughs> knows what is the bottle, what is the air, you know, but it was okay, let's see first. And, you know, we gotta, we gotta just came, you know, to see, to watch the event and we can talk later. And it ends like, you know, we was losing, you know, three, four events, you know, money. And then, you know, we started, you know, to, to get, you know, at the zero. And then we started to, to have, you know, profit, you know, on, on the events. So, I mean, This is the biggest obstacle, you know, when, when you don't know how the business works and when you don't know what do you have to sell. Because at the beginning, you know, when you have a lot of friends, you know, you know they are asking, oh, can I go in? You know, oh, I'm bringing my wife, I'm bringing my friend. Okay, and then you cannot say no because, you know, you are, you are too friendly, too kind, you know, to do that. But then you realize that with doing this, you are losing money. So to avoid this, you know, you have to, to hire, you know, security, so guards, and uh, you don't have to go outside, you know, of the arena because everybody will jump on you to get in. So, you know, it's few things, you know, what you have to learn, you know, and uh, you have to select, you know, which, which phone call, you know, you're going you're gonna to pick up, you know, on the day of the fight and which uh, you wouldn't. Okay. So you... Uh, you Overall, it was 147 events that you did, like um, around 50 of them together with your dad and, and the rest of them you did by yourself as the, as the main promoter. What were the learnings that it took out of those events? Because it, it also has been a span of almost three decades. 
Uh, and especially learnings that you that uh, you already mentioned some of that. But for example, that somebody who maybe just has their first event doesn't have yet. I, I you know, if if I have to to say something about the two, it's like uh, you know the my career with my father was like the school from one to eight when I was learning, you know, everything. So when I when I was putting down the basement and then, you know, uh, my career was like, well, like the college, you know, the university, because I was lucky and I got enough experience and I got enough credibility that, uh, that the TV signed me. And I was, you know, the main promoter for years. And then, obviously, it's much, much easier, you know, to promote when you have on your background, you know, a TV, when you can go and you don't even have to knock on the doors of the sponsors because they are looking, you know, for the good spots and they are looking for the possibilities. And, uh, you know, at the beginning, you know, my father, you know, when uh, we were promoting, you know, events, uh, I was always asking him money, you know, because we have to do this, we have to do that. And he always said, look, son, with money, even the stupid thing can buy. So try to buy, you know, try to figure out how to do without spending money because, you know, then the incoming, it's more for us. So it's not equal. And uh, I was a big barter making, you know, so... I gave spots and they gave me something, you know, the lights. I give like deal spots. making or something. Yeah, I give spots, you know, for another company and they give me the chairs. And, you know, at the end, you know, we, we, we minimalize, you know, our expenses. You know, that we didn't have to pay for the lights. We didn't have to pay for the chairs. You know, the catering, you know, I was doing the catering, you know, on the inverse side. So, because... I didn't have experience on catering. I said, okay, you can come here, but you have to pay for it. It's mm -hmm. like, you know, you are going in an expo or whatever. Uh, with the merchandise, I was doing the same thing. I said, okay, there is, you know, like five spots. One spot costs, you know, this amount of money. And then at the end of the day, you know, so I realized, you know, how I have to do this. But... First of all, you know, I was I was watching, you know, how the big ones, you know, they are doing, you know, like Universal, like Sauerland in Germany, like Acarius in France, like the Matchroom in England. So because I was in good relation with all of them, you know, I was like a kid, so nobody was afraid of me. Everybody was like, okay, yeah, come on, come on, you know, watch, watch <laughs> and learn, you know, so they, they let me in. And of course, you know, a few years later, you know, I was... We were challenging each other, you know, on the purse bits or, you know, our boxers were boxing against each other. But I was going, you know, through this to this learning period. You know, I was, let's say, you know, everybody's son because all of them, you know, like Barry Hearn, the father of Eddie Hearn or Klaus Peter Cole or Peter Hanratz or Wilfred Sauerland. You know, they were all like, you know, 30, 40 years, you know, older than me. So I wasn't, you know... A, let's say, you know, a danger to them because, you know, I was from an East country, from a different country, plus I was, you know, uh, younger than that. And, uh, you know, I, I was, I, I just wanted, you know, to, to, to learn, you know, so I was always, you know, I was the question guy. When I went somewhere, I always put questions. I have, you know, my own idols, you know, in boxing, two guys, uh, one from, from Holland, you know, Hank Ruling, who died, unfortunately. And another one, Mickey Duff from England, who died also. And they were the two biggest icons in boxing during the 70s till the 90s. You can imagine they were, you know, 13 weight division. And they too, they got, you know, like 10 or 11 champions out of the 13 divisions. Wow. So it's promoters. Yeah. You know. European champions. So they were the biggest thing in Europe. So if you if you wanted something, you had to deal with some of them. It was so, very so rare, you know, that, that someone else, you know, was winning a European title, for example. So to summarize it, like you went to the best and to ask questions. You went to the best to learn. Yeah. And you totally left your ego at the door 
and it was not about you. It was all about what can you learn from them? Like what, what are they great at? What is something you can take with you? Exactly. I'm, I'm, a, I'm working. I try to work the same way, you know, 50 cents, uh, the singer said mm -hmm. once, you know, that, that I haven't been to Harvard, but all my colleagues finished there. So I'm like this, you know, in my office. So my colleagues, you know, they are much, much smarter than me. I'm only good, you know, on, on selecting them, on selecting the best, you know. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, uh, it's something, you know, what, what if you want to learn, and you said about ego, so there is, there is no ego, you know, in learning. When you are it's learning something, so you have to be, to be honest, you know, you have to, to, to be, you know, like, uh, I don't know how, how to say, you know, to, to get, you know, all the information and then to select, you know, what is good for you. When you're saying that also, that reminds me of Andrew Carnegie, one, one, at one time, one of the richest men in history, actually, uh, the steel magnet. And he's, he said back then that like, he was a steel magnet, but I have no idea how to make steel, but I have a lot of people that know how to do it. Yeah, that's right. So it's, it's, a. Uh... It's like this, you know, all, all my colleagues, you know, they are doing things what I have no clue, you know, but, but, you know, everything is working because I'm doing something what maybe they don't want to do or they are not, they are not good at it. And, uh, you know, we are sharing, you know, the tasks. So, you know, everybody's doing, you know, something in which is good. So um, one, one question actually that popped up to me, and I think that's, a, that's an issue also in, in different countries, it's being handled differently. That is, you mentioned before that you were lucky to get a TV contract as a promoter. So um, for, and I know that, that, that especially in the German market, some, some promoters are actually struggling to get a TV contract, even though they have um, great fighters. So what's the secret of getting a TV contract in your eyes? Um, I don't think that there is a big secret, you know, it's a, it's a very, very hard work. You know, I was building, you know, my, my company and the reputation of my company by, by having a lot of media partners. So everywhere when I was promoting, I got like, you know, the local newspaper, the local radio, the local TV. And uh, I tried to get, you know, good relation with all of them because it was very important, you know, to, go, to do sellouts. And I wasn't jumping, you know, to like uh, 4,000 or 5,000, you know, sports hall. I was starting, you know, like easy, 800, then, you know, 1,200, 2,000, you know. So I wasn't uh, jumping, you know, I wasn't, dreaming, you know, more than I could chewing, you know, that was maybe one of the secrets. And after I, I have done, you know, like five, 10, 15 events, and it were, you know, always or almost a sellout, you know, the people from the TV, you know, they are a little bit everywhere because of this, because of that. And, uh, and I just came, you know, in their, in their radar. And one of them, you know, he was asking me, oh, do you have a TV? I said, yeah, I have a TV at home. No, 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 I mean a TV yeah. deal. Oh, no, I don't have a TV deal. Oh, if you want, I can put you in contact with someone, you know, from the TV. Maybe they would be interested. And, uh, you know, that's how it started. You know, we started with one event. Then we started with another one. And, you know, the numbers, you know, so because it was something new, even in, in, in Hungary, you know, at the time, early 20s, you know, so 2000, uh, it was, you know, it was easier to sell an event than now, you know, now you have like, you know, if you, you, you switch, you know, your, uh, your, your TV, you have like hundred choices are, are unlimited nowadays. Yes. So at the time, you know, they were like, you know, eight, 10, you know, channels. So it was much easier, you know, so because I'm still keeping, you know, this 3.2 million viewers. It, one of the reasons is this. It's not because because I was the best. Which is which is the television record in Hungary, 3.2 million viewers. Yes, yes. So it's, uh, 
it, because I was I was lucky, and at the time, you know, they were not uh, National Geographic and Spectrum and Discovery and, and Disney and all other, you know, channels. And that was, you know, I was lucky, you know, that that I get, you know, uh, the TV contract. Then I got, you know, my media partners, which were helping me, you know, to build all the events. I got like six to eight events per year. I got, you know, then, you know, the uh, Hungarian radio station, the biggest radio station. So which was helping me, you know, by, by giving, you know, spots like six, eight times per day, which was a huge help because all the people, you know, who was on the car, you know, was listening in the morning, the radio. Then they got in, in front of the computer. They saw, you know, on the newspapers all night, you know, the, the promotion of the event. They went home in the evening. They, they, they saw, you know, the, the spot on the TV. So they were kind of obliged, you know, to see what, what is doing, you know, this guy or what, what is going to happen on the side of Saturday. So it was like this. It, it sounds like, like you did many things right. Uh, like really to, to get all of this promotion together, like in, in terms of promoting one thing, like as a, and, and also, of course, you also need to do to promote the boxes. Like you need to build the athletes, you need to build the adversary because the stronger the adversary, the, the, the harder it gets and the more people are inclined to watch it. If you, If you would give an, a piece of advice in, in a non-boxing world to somebody who is, who is out there and who says, well, um, I got to get some more awareness around myself. Like I want to build my personal brand. I want to build myself up and, and to be recognized maybe also by the media or just to, to basically uh, to be recognized for a certain topic. What advice would you give to that person? You know, this is... This is not, you know, like a, like a doctor, you know, who can tell you almost exactly, you know, uh, what to do, you know, in order to avoid, you know, these kind of illnesses. I think that, you know, the charisma of a person is very important. That's why I used to say to my daughter, you know, I don't care how you're gonna be, but try to be, you know, somehow you know to be different you know so because if you are normal then nobody cares about you so you have to be a little bit like let's say different you have to to let yourself doing things what others you know they are not allow themselves they are afraid to do it you know i was just a short uh story you know about about the event i was talking you know this 3.2 million uh, there is a boxing icon in hungary coco kova ishtan Kovax, who was he won everything european champion world champion olympic champion as professional was european champion world champion and he got beat his only his sole defeat against a guy from argentina so you can imagine, you know, our our idol, you know, he lost in Budapest in front of 20,000 people. What do I do in this case? I have another guy in this weight division. So I'm going to bring back the guy who beat our idol and I'm going to put the two guys together. That brings me 3.2 million viewers. But, but prior of this, you know, because the guy was a world champion, was a very well-known guy, he was asking a fortune. I didn't get this amount of money. But I was like, you know, when you are playing cards, I was asking a card where I already got 19. So I sold my house. A blackjack. Yeah, I sold my house, my car, and I was putting all the money on this event, but everything, everything I got. So I was literally, you know, so if this event doesn't went, you know, how, how I was planning to go, I was like, you know, a broken guy, but I was 28 and I, I said to myself, okay, so 
what if I'm going to lose everything? I have enough time to rebuild everything. Because I have, I was not overconfident, but I was believing in myself, in my capabilities, you know, in my knowledge and everything. And I was doing this. Of course, now, when I'm 51 and I have, you know, family and everything, I won't do it again. But there is times when you have to, to dream big and you have to step. You have to make the first step, you know, on achieving your dreams. And I think, you know, that a lot of people are dreaming about something, but they are never doing anything to accomplishing, to achieving, you know, their dream. And I can see even around me, you know, because they are too comfortable. They are okay with what they have. They are fine with, uh, with, with their life. And that's it. And I was, I was almost the kind of guy, you know, who's, who's a risky guy who likes to take risks, you know, and I have done this, you know, in my career as a, as a promoter, like two, three times when I was bringing here a boxer who was better against the Hungarian and we won. Of course, okay. you need luck. It's like, you know, with the goalkeeper, you know, only the good goalkeepers, you know, are lucky. So you, you just have to, to, to work hard, you know, so that's, that's one of the secrets, I think. But you were actually, um, you were also betting on yourself. So basically, I, I guess it paid off uh, the bet at, at that event. I mean, at least in terms of 3.2 million viewers, did it also pay off financially? And also, how did this change your career? Oh, after this event, you know, all the TVs were, were jumping on me, you know, on my company <laughs> and uh, were offering, you know, me contracts. So I got... I got, you know, an offer from the TV where I had been, the TV2. And I got, you know, other two offers for other two TVs from RTL and from Viasat. And uh, at the time of the RTL, RTL was broadcasting the Universum events. And uh, I never liked it to be second. And I said that I won't go to the RTL because then I'm going to be second. I rather prefer to stay on a let's say a little bit smaller channel, but here to be number one. And then challenging, you know, the RTL. And uh, it pays off because, you know, uh, we got events on the same time, twice, and we won twice against them. And uh, that, was, that was also not really thank, you know, to, to my matchmaking, it was that I was putting a lot of energy on the media, on the media partners and on building my event. And for different reasons, I always make it, you know, interesting, you know, the event for some reason. Because they were, you know, um, you know, at the time, you know, in 2001, 2002, I was one of the few promoters in Europe or in the world who was working with with women, with, with women boxers. I got at the time two world champions, Victoria Milo and Bettina Chabi. Actually, Bettina Chabi, she started, you know, her boxing career in, in Austria with a guy called Peter Pospital. And then she signed with me. And uh, I put uh, both of them, you know, on the Playboy, you know, Playboy. So, I was so it, it's basically about telling a story as well. Like you, yeah, yeah, you're yeah. a storyteller so, with your event. Exactly. So, you know, I was, I was introducing them, you know, first on the Playboy. I was in good relation with the Hungarian Playboy owner. I was telling him, you know, what I'm going to do, what I'm planning to do. And they were building, you know, my two girls, which were really nice, both of them. And you, you know mean the Playboy magazine? The Playboy magazine, yeah. So they were both of them on the cover of the Playboy magazine. <laughs> and then and then you know, like seven, eight months later, I was putting them against each other. Of course, it was a good view because everybody was curious, you know. <laughs> they saw they saw them, you know, on the cover of the Playboy, they was reading about it, you know, they like it, you know, they just want to see, you know, how what are they going to do with each other? <laughs> well, that's a funny story. Um, 
One last event question to you before actually I want to also ask you uh, as a boxing manager. You also went to Dubai in 2003. Yeah. What made you go to Dubai? Um, like, because back then you were the first promoter to go there and it was quite also another step as a pioneer. You know, Dubai, you know, when, when we are talking about uh, Dubai or Emirates, we are always imagining, you know, out of oil, gold, diamonds, everything. I was imagining the same thing, actually. And um, I got there, you know, uh, an American guy who I met, you know, uh, somewhere in the world. And he once contacted me and uh, he was asking me, what do you think about promoting an event in Dubai? And I said, okay, uh, someone uh, did an event? No, 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 we're going to be the first. And I said, okay, let's do it, you know. And uh, I was flying to Dubai. He was, uh, he was talking with few uh, sponsors, so we got the budget. But then, you know, when I got there, I realized that, uh, that nothing is like, uh, like in Europe or like in Hungary, you know, because... They didn't get a ring, and I was not thinking about this. <laughs> I had to bring a ring from Yemen, you know, from another country, which cost me a lot. They got, you know, lights and everything, but because I was sending him, you know, so what I want. But the technicians was people, you know, from Pakistan, which didn't understand, you know, what I wanted. So finally, you know, we find, you know, a, a German company who was helping me out, you know, with all these things, you know, with lights and with uh, electricity and with everything. Then, you know, we got a, a good relation with, um, with a guy from Dubai, you know, which, which got a huge hotel, you know, like 20 floors. And uh, he gave us for uh, this event, you know, like two floors, like, You know, 25 rooms. And uh, we was just doing everything, you know, very hard because he gave us the hotel. Then we got another partner for the food. Then we got another for the lights. But so it was, it was really, really hard, you know, to handle everything. And on the end of the day, you know, we got like, we didn't earn too much money. So basically I... I I don't even remember if we earned money out of the event or not, but we write history. So that was the only positive thing. And then, you know, I said myself, you know, that, okay, I was the first, I have done the event. Then let's make, you know, easier the life and let's do event, you know, and events, you know, on the fields, you know, what you know, like, you know, Europe, you know, and I was starting to do co-promotions, you know, in Serbia, in Romania, in Italy, and uh, that was much, much easier, you know, because of the language, because of the tradition, because of the culture. There were not culture, you know, differences. Uh, you know, in Dubai, you know, we have uh, done, you know, the event on the Aviator Center, which, uh, which was a tennis court. And, uh, you know, it was a court of like, you know, 2000 something and we got like a half house so uh, mm. it was not really good to see you know optically you know compared to all the I'm empty doing, chairs yeah, yeah compared to what i'm doing here so i have done here you know most of my events were sell out you know before the event and then i'm going there with the big ego let's say because you know i was i was like uh, you know um, how, how to say you know It's, it's, it know, was the same year that you all had the record-breaking Polish, uh, uh, Hungarian event. Yeah, and then, you know, I got there and I said, you know, I got the half house. So it's like, a, it's like so why, why should I do this again, you know, when I, when I have back, you know, uh, the full house, when I have to do, you know, a, a half houses. And that's it. And then, you know, like 18 years later or, you know, 16 years later, they discover, uh, you know, Dubai. They were smarter than me because they were not only imagining the oil, the, the, the diamonds and the gold they were founding, you know, and uh, they were promoting, you know, events like Matchroom and Top Rank. Wow. Let, let's uh, switch over to the manager point um, because 
one thing that you have mentioned several times is that you need to have charisma. And I remember I read the biography of Muhammad Ali when he said that one of his big secrets when he started out as a, as a professional was that he actually had a role model who was a pre professional wrestler at the time who was always talking like a lot of, um, how do you say that? Like, like in terms of he was very good at talking and, and of getting people to want to see him. And so that then he, he took this as a role model and as an inspiration and to also create some lines and to think about what am I going to say in order to get other people to, well, I want to know who that guy is. Like, who is this guy who's always having a big mouth? And so what actually do you need to be charismatic? Because this does not just translate to boxing. It translates to everything. Exactly. You know, so that's why... That's why I was doing, you know, and I was building the boxers, you know, because building the boxers, you know, make, make interest. So they want to see, you know, the guy they, they were reading or uh, they were, you know, uh, hurting about it, you know, so you have, you have to do something, you know, we need so, something, you know, interesting in order to get viewers, you know, it's like Tyson Fury, you know, Tyson Fury, he, He didn't who is the, right now the, the um, heavyweight champion of the world in the yeah. WBC? Yeah, he wasn't he wasn't fighting since like you know I don't know 2022 or something like this. But almost every week you can read something about because he's doing out of the ring you know a lot of things. He has you know this uh, this Netflix thing, you know he's going here, he's going there, you know he's talking with this. So it's 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 always so you have to to keep update you know yourself to the media so they have to know about you you know if you're not if you're staying at home and you are reading you are good for your wife and you are you know good for your children but you know the other people they don't care about you because you know lately you know the world it's it's so fast and you always have to do something special you know to to just you know be be a uh, How is it visible, you know, for the other people? So if you are just a normal people, a boring guy, like I am actually, actually I'm a very boring guy, you know. I like, you know, to think a lot. I'm, you know, in the garden for like hours and I, I'm kind of meditating and I'm kind of thinking about things. Then I'm going back in the house. I'm writing down, you know, all the things, you know, which came on my mind. And then I try with my smart colleagues, you know, to deliver. See, but in my, in my private life, I'm a very boring guy. You know, I'm not doing nothing special. You know, I'm coming to work. I'm going, you know, to pick up my daughter. I'm going, you know, to have a dinner with my wife, you know, so nothing special. So I, I studied, uh, one of my studies that I did was I studied sports at the university. And one of the things that we learned back then was to become an Olympic champion, you need to be born for it. What that meant, for example, in a 100 meter sprint, you need to have the genetic um, components in order to actually be able to run 100 meters that fast. I'm not sure if with boxing it is the same, but when... And you have worked with more than 50 champions, including three world champions. What are the qual qualities that you are actually looking for when you discover a talent? I think, you know, the, the life out of the ring, it's, uh, it's quite important. So it's not equal, but it's quite important. I can give you an, uh, uh, an example. You know, maybe you heard about Ryan Garcia. King, he called himself King Ryan Garcia. He's an upcomer guy, a very good looking guy. You know, he's, he's a little bit like Oscar de la Hoya. He looked like Oscar de la Hoya. He's good in the ring, so he delivers in the ring, but he will never be. I wish, I wish him to be, but I don't think that he will ever be a unified world champion. But he has, he has like millions of followers, you know, on the Instagram and on the TikTok. So 
that mean that he is very, very interesting as a person out of the ring. And the people who follow him, you know, on the, on the social media, will watch his fights too. You understand? So it's, yeah. you have to put, you know, this is, it's, it's, like a, it's like a package. To be successful, you have to have a good story. You have to know to sell yourself. And you have to keep, you know, everything around you. I mean, the story and, uh, and, and you know, you have to, to feed the media, you know, always with, with, with things, with news, with everything. Mm. You know, because if it's one shot, okay, something happened, you know, I was like a, a survivor on a car accident and blah, blah, blah. Okay, they will write about you once, twice, three times. They will watch you and that's it. So you wow. have to, you know, you have to give, you know, permanently something, you know, to the media, to the people around you. And what you're saying is is not just true in boxing. It's true in everybody who wants to build a brand and everybody who wants exactly. to build a business. You need to stay relevant. You need to create content. You need to think about how, like, how can you create something or put something out into the world that is interesting for people that people care about because if people don't care then wh who are you doing it for exactly and in order to, for people to care you need to care about the people so i you know that's why i said that you know charisma it's something what you cannot learn you know i was signing a lot of boxers not because i'm I'm a very nice guy, or I'm, I'm very sympathetic. No, not at all. This is a business. It's because I was giving them what the other couldn't give them. That's why they choose me. Because I was never hanging out with any of my boxers. Never, ever. I was never inviting them to a dinner, you know, in my house or, you know, on the weekend. No. This is what it was was pure business. Was in, we were in very good relation with each other, but I was never mixed. Never. I was always keeping the distance. I was representing them, you know, like a lawyer. I was fighting for them, you know, with the TV, with the smoke. I was always representing them, but I was never going out with them, you know, on the weekend to a disco or whatever. No, never. That's what I want to say, you know, the manager, you know, a lot of managers, you know, they think, you know, that they are good because they are doing this. And at the end, you know, they end up, you know, by broken with each other because it, it become a friendship. And then when, when it's a friendship, you know, there is, there is missing, you know, the respect sometimes, and there is missing, you know, the, the, the difference, let's say, the hierarchy between the boxer and the manager. It's not because, yes, there is not basically a hierarchy, but the manager, it's always older. It's always someone, you know, who take care of the boxer. It's a little bit mm -hmm. like in a higher position. Even if the boxer, it's a, it's a super talented world champion. It's always, you know, the, the manager who's the advisor, a little bit the mentor would take care of him. So now you're, on the one hand, what you're doing now is that you're also a supervisor, like you're a supervisor for the IBO, mm -hmm. um, which means that you get to travel a lot and you have another project just around the corner or ready to launch. Would you like to tell us something about that? Yeah, we're gonna, so we are preparing to launch, you know, in like one week. So basically seven days, 10 days maximum. And, uh, we have created the first ever amateur and professional boxing platform. Because, you know, the amateur and professional, they are a little bit like the, the dogs and the cats. They don't really like each other, but they know about each other always, you know. So, you know, most of the good amateurs, they are turning pro. So the amateurs, they are watching who's the best promoter, where should I go? who's paying me well, etc. The promoters, they are watching the amateurs, 
because they are trying to pick up, you know, the best of them. But they don't have a platform in the world, it's not existing, where you can find, you know, both of them. And I said, okay, let's be, you know, the first to do this bridge between the two. And we came up, you know, with this platform, which uh, we will have, you know, live streams, amateur boxing events or tournaments, professional boxing events. We're going to have news. We're going to have archives and a lot of information, you know, on the platform. Wow. I'm, I'm are, excited to, to look into work, it. Yeah, we are working, you know, since last, uh, last October. So basically one year, you know, they, it took me one year. Wow. Okay. Awesome. Felix, if somebody would like to find out more about you, where can they find you? Uh, to you. <laughs> so we can come. <laughs> I don't know. So, you know, I'm, I'm easy to, to, to be. So I, I, I'm reachable, you know, on Facebook. They can reach me on LinkedIn. They can reach me. So if I was always telling, you know, so I got so much good things, you know, in my life that, it will be a pleasure for me to help other people because, you know, I got so many good things, you know, from from people, you know, around the world who are not related to me. They just said, you know, OK, come on. OK, let's I'm going to help you. I'm going to do that for you. I'm going to. And I said, you know, myself when I was young, that when I'm going to be older like now, and I will have the chance and the opportunity to help other people, to help upcomers, to help talented people. I will do it, no problem. So if someone thinks, you know, that I can give him a good advice, then um, he's welcome, you know, to contact me basically anyway. Oh, that's beautiful. Uh, thank you so much. One final closing thought or piece of advice that you would like to leave us with? Mm, I don't know, you know, so I'm, I'm not uh, the kind of person, you know, who who just tell you know, big things and um, give big advices, you know, to the others. I think that, you know, uh, everybody has to, to enjoy his life. And what is very important, you know, to have the courage, you know, to do what you imagine. Because, you know, how I said, you know, previously, most of the people, even around me, they, they, they are planning things for like years and they, they are never delivering. They are never, they have never enough courage, you know, to do that. So this is for me, you know, it's the only advice, you know, to, to do it. Mm, beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you for thank all you. of thank your you. wisdom, for your inspirational words. Um, and once again, thank you. Give it up for Felix Ratz. Thank you very much. Woo! Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sticking with us until the end. To make this content even more valuable for you, please leave a comment below and share your thoughts and also share this video with somebody you care about who absolutely needs to see this. Thank you very much. Have an outstanding day and see you next time.